for six years, the, war, the nation's largest and one of the most influential organizations in the world, one of the most democratic organizations in the world, has been led by one of Arizona's own, one of AEA's own, a former president of the Paradise Valley Education Association, a former math teacher in the Paradise Valley District, our own Dennis Van Roekel. I got a couple of pictures on my bookshelf at home. Uh, when I was AEA treasurer and Dennis was treasurer, there's a shot of both of us. He looks very handsome. His hair was still white even then. Um, then a few years later, I've got a picture of us. I'm AEA vice president. He's NEA vice president. He looks very distinguished. We both look a lot older. I never got the one of being AEA president next to Dennis with, with NEA president, but there's still time. Um, as many of you know that, uh, as Nicole pointed out, my wife was an excellent English teacher. Um, thank you, Nicole. I taught English for a while also, and uh, one of my great challenges was introducing my students to the relevance of the Canterbury Tales. And one of the points of, of distinction about the Canterbury Tales, it was one of the first looks at the common person up close. So when Chaucer wrote these descriptions of all the folks that went on the pilgrimage to Canterbury, which was done in the spring, um, he detailed each one of them in a way that hadn't been done of the common man. Dennis is from Iowa, and Dennis will tell you himself that he is basically a common man. We would disagree because he's possessed of so many extraordinary traits, characteristics, and such a compelling character that it was altogether fitting for him to be able to tell the story for six years as president and for many years prior to that in NEA leadership of what it is to be a believer, completely committed to public education. There was also a good and gentle knight. That's how Chaucer begins the description of the knight that went with those on the pilgrimage to Canterbury. He describes him as noble, gentle of nature, persistent, caring, protective. There was also a good and gentle knight in the NEA for many, many years, and he's with us today, and his name is Dennis Van Roekel. Dennis. Thank you. Thank you so much. Lift that up and let me take the binder. I'll take the binder. Oh, yeah. See, my local president is here. That's good. I've got both my presidents here, right, my Washington. state and my local president. That's good. Um, it's always a pleasure to be in Arizona uh, and to bring you greetings from all of your colleagues all across this country. And, of course, to Andrew, Joe, who left when I was going to speak. Oh, he's in the back. And to Nydia and to Renee as the interim executive director. Uh, it is really a pleasure to be here. Where's Jason? Is he in here? Oh, there you are. Okay. He's on my board of directors. I have to be careful of him. Because uh, <laughs> we're adopting a budget next week. So, <laughs> um, But, you know, the first thing I need to talk about is to say congratulations to AEA. Holy cow, did you guys kick butt and take names? I mean, House Bill 2911? Oh, my God. I'm telling you, the emails were flying through NEA. They couldn't stop talking about the, the little train that could. Um, <laughs> no, there, was, there were so many compliments about Andrew and the coalition that's been built in Arizona. You know, see, guys, sometimes it's really important to know those times when you get over the hump. And I know that in the last decade, um, it's been hard in Arizona. It's been hard to be from Arizona. Um, <laughs> Uh, when they tell me what the latest version that comes out of the legislature, you go, oh my God, <laughs> they really did that. By the way, John Wright says hi, and he also sent me a tweet from Martin, some Martin in the Senate. Oh, yeah. He tweeted on Earth Day that trees in Arizona, their root system absorb 600 gallons of water a day. Al Melvin. Al Melvin. Oh, Al Melvin, I'm sorry. 
and that that's part of Arizona's problem with not having enough water. I think science teachers need to talk to this man and explain the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide. I mean, if we killed all the trees in, in the world, we'd have more water to drink, but we couldn't breathe, so I don't know, which is... Um, <laughs> But I was so proud as to, to listen to everybody and to read the emails as they were talking about the incredible things. And I know you did that. All of you in this room played a role in that because you're leaders or you wouldn't be here. And so it was with great pride I listened. And by the way, this Hoopenthal, you are going to get rid of him this fall, right? I mean... You know, you know from previous times, I love the word audacity. And I told you when growing up, the most common time they said it was, I can't believe she had the audacity to wear that to church. <laughs> um, but see, here's another good use in that same tone. I can't believe he has the audacity as state superintendent of public instruction to advocate to take funds away from public school. I, it's, see, you know, I know I'm a bit anal retentive and linear, linear sequential as a math teacher, but there are some things that logic just needs to follow, and that is a contradiction, and it's wrong. So I think we need somebody in there who actually believes in the vision that this country has had since its beginning, that no matter what your dream is, the vehicle is public education, and it's for everyone, not just some. <clears throat> Well, today I was thinking about what I wanted to say to you, and it's, I decided I'm going to divide it into bad news, good news, and a challenge. Bad news, good news, and a challenge. How many people in this room started teaching in 2002 or later? Raise your hand. Look around this room. Now, for all of you who didn't raise your hand, you need to feel sorry for this group of people. <laughs> they have been cheated. They have been totally cheated of knowing what education can be like when it wasn't No Child Left Behind. And it pains me to know that there are people who've taught 10 years. They're not a rookie anymore. And the only experience they know is under No Child Left Behind. Now, where are the retirees sitting? Oh, yeah, there they are. So, oh, geez, the whole bath. Now see, that group, they're spoiled rotten. And I'm in their group because we all got to taught, be, teach before 1983, didn't you? Yeah. And see, before 1983, a nation at risk, we had the honor of being part of an educational system where public education was always seen as the solution, never the problem. And so no matter what ailed this country, post-World War II GI Bill, Sputnik, and we had to have the National Defense Education Act, and we had IDEA and Elementary Secondary Education Act, and Education of Migrant Families, and on and on and on and on. Everything was built because whatever ailed us, whatever held us back as a nation, education was the way to do that. And then in 83, it all changed, and in 2002, again. But this time, briefly, Think of what's happened since 2002. The most important thing is that they built a foundation upon which later so much would be built. They decided to test every student in grades three through eight in mathematics and language arts. And from that spawned all kinds of reality, narrowing of curriculum, elimination of PE and the arts, and tests and practice tests and pre-test and drill for tests. And we then use those test results to build this whole system. But meanwhile, when that was going on in 2010, another bombshell dropped in Wisconsin. Actually, it started in Alabama. In the lame duck session after the 2010 election, that's when they voted to take payroll deduction away from the Alabama Education Association, one of the other AEAs. And since that time, in, in the years 11 through 14, it has been unprecedented the attacks on unions and on public workers. They talk about these average pensions of $20,000 a year being exorbitant. And how dare these people just get rich off the society. 
Yeah, right. They've gone after unions, their, their right to bargain, right to work states. I mean, can you believe that Michigan is a right to work state? I mean, they were always held up as the Mecca. They were held up as the institution. And Wisconsin, it will not be in my lifetime for sure that they ever, ever, if ever, get back to where they were. Bargaining law for over 30 years, agency fee, they don't have any of that. And it's all happened in that period since 2010. But there's another thing going on. And all that time was dealing with privatization and this corporate reform. And th this system of accountability, they call it, the accountability system. Remember I talked about those tests? They built on that foundation that you could use those test scores to evaluate students, schools, districts, teachers, and now they're saying even institutions that prepare teachers can be evaluated and categorized and graded based on test scores of students in grades three through eight in two subjects. Now, one of the really good news now is I swear to you that that system is going to crumble. It's not a question of if, it is only a question of when. It will crumble. And the signs are evident everywhere. It's this organic happening that's just arising in so many places. A year ago in New York, 1,800 parents opted their students out of the testing. This year, 20,000. 20,000. And more and more are starting to understand that the promise of what that testing would do hasn't delivered in a decade. And they're starting to understand what it does to students. They're starting to finally hear, hear actually the words, describe what elementary kids go through under the pressure of this stupid test. And parents are saying, this is not right. It's not right for my son and daughter. They're not in the political process. They're just caring about their children. And they're saying it's wrong. And there are superintendents in Texas, of all places, the place that started all this fervor about testing and the miracle of Houston, which was all BS. They lied. But they're saying this testing is out of sight. But the other thing that's happening is the logic and the facts are just taken over. We filed a lawsuit in Florida, and I can't tell you how much fun it is to talk about this with members of the press. Because see, in Florida, they were uh, leading the game. I mean, they have Jeb Bush as their cheerleader. So of course, they had tests like everybody else. It's called the FCAT. I have no idea what the acronym is. It's Florida something. <laughs> Achievement is in there, probably. But... So, but they were leaders. So not only did they have these test scores, but they started piling this on. So like so many after Race of the Top, they said it has to be used in evaluation, 50% based on test scores. And then they said your promotion would depend on test scores. Then they said your compensation would depend on test scores. And then they said even your employment status. That's when we filed a lawsuit. Seven plaintiffs. One of them is Kim Cook. She's a first grade teacher in a K-2 school. The year before, she was Teacher of the Year. The next year, she was rated unsatisfactory. Now, what makes that so important is because if you get two unsatisfactory ratings in a row, you can be fired. So she's got one now. But remember, I said she teaches first grade. There are no tests in first grade. The state-mandated test starts in third. And there are no third graders in her school. So 50% of her evaluation was based on math scores of fourth and fifth graders in a different elementary school down the road. Students she's never seen nor taught. Now, that impacts 70% of all teachers in Florida. But here is the best part. When you file a lawsuit, you get to take depositions. And you know, when you're under oath, you treat that differently than when you're just giving a speech. You know, <laughs> you want to be factual. Instead of what I say, you know, who's going to challenge what I say? You don't know. By the way, I didn't get to hear Andrew. Was he all right last night? All right. 
Just checking, just checking. I just finished about 10 minutes. Yeah, I just finished 10 minutes ago. <laughs> so under deposition, they asked the people from the district, do you believe that this system that you've implemented has any validity or reliability for the 70% of the teachers who are non-FCAT teachers, either subject or grade? They said, no. They said, do you believe it undermines a whole evaluation system to force everyone into it? And they go, yeah. Okay. They asked the Department of Education, do you believe that there is any validity or reliability for the non-FCAT teachers? They said, no. But you still required every district to do this. Yes. We had an expert of mathematics out of Stanford who said that the rate punishing and rewarding teachers based on their value-added model was no more accurate than doing it by random selection. In fact, he said you may cause more harm than by random. Because by random, at least you could excuse, well, I just lost the flip of the coin. But on this, somebody is making a conscious decision. So as this organic movement comes up, it's going to crumble because it's all based on this test. And now we've got park and smarter balance. Not that I'm opposed to those, but people are reacting negatively. We've had several states who are pulling out already, which is a bit scary because they think in a year they'll develop something better. They don't know about test development. They don't understand. In Tennessee, one member of the legislature was asked what, they've spent three years developing this. What would you, how would you do it in a year? He said, well, there's got to be some smart people at the university who could do this. <laughs> yep, they're not in the legislature, those smart people. Uh, <laughs> that's a fact. Uh, that's not a, that's a fact. Uh, so the good news to me is that this stuff is going to crumble. And what I believe our responsibility is as an organized institution is to help that organic movement. See, it's much better that we help that rather than be the movement. Because it's, got, it's so much more powerful when people start to understand that it's wrong for kids. And this debate on the Common Core Standards, it's really kind of baffling. I mean, I always say, okay, get rid of them. What are you going to use instead? Oh, well, I hadn't thought about that. I mean, really, I don't care who you are. If you teach any course, whether you have a syllabus or a textbook, you have to know something about what you expect of students. I mean, can you imagine teaching a class of any grade and every day having no idea what you're going to do? Well, just let the flow go. <laughs> you know where you're trying to teach, what you're trying to teach them. So if it's not these standards, if there's something wrong, take it out what's wrong or add back in what should be there, but you, the adults in the system should be able to do that. And then we have to figure out a way to implement that well, and my gosh, don't you dare try and implement it without talking to the people you expect to do that. Talk about stupidity. Why would you think people on the outside could explain how to implement that in a classroom? You need to talk to those people, but the standards themselves, they're not the problem, it's how you implement it. But of course, they're tied to the testing and tied to this accountability system. Now, here's the challenge. I want you to imagine a long table in front of me, and on that table is all of the crap, that's a technical term, uh, <laughs> all of the crap that they have put together since 2002 about the testing and the use of tests and this, quote, accountability system that you can measure anything and everything by a test score given one day of the year. By the way, if any of you have ever applied for financing or refinancing of a house, I want you to think back and whether the evaluation of whether or not you were credit worthy, that they only asked you one question. What was your checkbook balance on April 7th? <laughs> because on that one day, I could determine everything I need to know about you. I said this to a businessman, I said, when you buy a corporation, you know, you absorb these. Is that all you ask? Checkbook balance on one day? Or is there other information you would like? Debt to equity ratio, net assets, profits over the last five years, projections in the future. You gather all of that information and I defy you that any corporation or company you've ever purchased is as complex as the American education system. 
with a federal government with rules and regulation and laws and some money, 50 different states deciding what they think it ought to be, and 15,000 school districts, and you think you can deter evaluate that system with one number derived on one day by third to eighth graders. The CEO looked at me and goes, I never thought of it that way. <laughs> so that's going to fall. But here's our challenge, because all that crap is on the table. And I see us as this great organization, along with all of our cohorts who are building this organic, and it's a giant arm, and we're going to push it off the table. And of course, our first reaction will be to cheer. Because when you're playing defense and you're going after bad ideas, like a house bill, it is worth celebrating when you kick that thing off the table. But then reality comes. What's now on the table? Nothing. And do you think there will be a void for longer than one nanosecond? And my fear is that somebody immediately will place something on the table that for the next decade, we will fight again, just like we did No Child Left Behind. Can you imagine our life as educators that for the next 10 years after we topple all this crap, we now have another gem on the table that we'll spend another decade trying to get rid of. So the challenge for us is to do two things at once. We need to manage this defense and fighting all these bad ideas, and we need to continue to start pushing that off the table. And as it's moving off, we need to place on the table what we want. What we want. What we believe as professionals, as educators, are the right things for children in America. And if we don't do that, we have no one to blame but ourselves. Because we'll take someone else's idea. And who do you want to put the idea on the table? Congress? Superintendents in Texas? State legislature in Arizona? So it is our challenge, responsibility, and opportunity to put that on the table. Now, when we do that, we have to change and shift how we view the world. It's not about an accountability system. It's about accountability for the system, the whole system. See, just as I made fun of that they're trying to evaluate this complex entity called public education by taking a test score on one day, what it negates is that there are other parts of that system that are critical. For example, who is responsible and accountable for school readiness? When every piece of research for the last 30 years says that if you deny young people, especially those who come from low-income families and who are shortchanged in their early life, if you deny them early childhood education, we know what happens. And when you know that's true and you don't do it, that's malpractice. You see, if a doctor, you go to the doctor and he or she figures out what's wrong and knows what, they sh what he or she should prescribe for you and then gives you something else, you would sue them for malpractice. When you know the right thing to do and you don't do it, that's malpractice. And they're doing that. And who's accountable for that? Who's accountable for a quality workforce? I've told this story so many times around this country. A lot of people, as soon as I start down the road, they go, oh, here comes the haircut story. But it happened right here in Arizona. Mike Garcia has been cutting my hair since 1974. And one day I was getting a haircut, and I saw this guy come in the barbershop, and all of a sudden Mike's acting weird. He's arranging his electrical cords, and there's this container with combs in it, and he, it's about a third full of liquid, and he fills it up. Pretty soon this guy comes into Mike's area. So I said to this guy, what do you, what do, you do? He said, well, I'm an inspector. And by the way, when he came, the first thing he did was look at the license on the wall. He looked at those electrical cords that Mike just rearranged, and he checked that container that Mike just filled. <laughs> and I said, so what do you do if, for example, Mike's license wasn't valid? He said, well, I'd shut down the place. I said, when, like the end of the month? He said, no, right now, today. 
I would empty the place and tell him to lock the door. I said, you're kidding. He said, no. He said, in these hard economic times, you know, the other day I found a guy cutting hair next to his trailer. I said, what's the worst thing that would happen if I got my hair cut by an unlicensed barber? Bad haircut. It'll grow back. <laughs> but don't you think it's just a bit ironic and horrible that you cannot cut hair in this state without a license, but you can be the teacher of record for 35 kids? How dare they do that? And who is accountable for that? How dare they put an unlicensed, untrained, uncertified individual and call them the teacher of record? Some, that's part of this system. And what about the teaching and learning conditions? Who's accountable for making sure they're right? You could take the most talented, skilled surgeon in the world, take them out of the operating room, take away all of the sterile atmosphere, take away anyone assisting them, and they will not get the same results. They'll still do their best, as we know our military do on the battlefield all the time. But when you're a medic on the battlefield, you do not get the same results as if you're given the proper surroundings. Who's responsible for that? How dare they take some children in America and put them in the best of circumstances and others are put in buildings that look like worn out factories? Who's accountable? Who's responsible? Now when it comes to the profession and our professional practice, I don't want them to touch that. We need to do that. I want us to define what it means to be a professional and not just in teaching in the classroom. Every single adult who works in a public school ought to feel that pride of who you are, what you do, and establish the standards of performance, of practice, of what you do. We should do that, not somebody on the outside. That's the making of a profession. That's the identification of a profession that you define it. And when it comes to professional practice, how dare we allow someone on the outside to do that? Give someone a script and call them a teacher? Are you kidding me? That's, that's malpractice. It's wrong. So in that arena, in that arena, I want us to be responsible and accountable. I like the word responsible better. It's our responsibility. But when it comes to funding and resources, I can't do that. But the system demands that someone be accountable. You know, a long time ago, a past president of AEA, Kay Brilliant, back in the days when she was still Kay Liebeck, made a brilliant statement. Did you notice how I did that? Yeah, was nice. <laughs> brilliant statement. Um, she said, you know, in education, we ask the right questions, but sometimes we put them in the wrong order. And sometimes we ask for the money first. Wrong order. The first question you have to deal with is, what is it that we want for every child in Arizona? As a society, as a state legislature, as parents, as community, as a state, we have to answer that question. What do you want to provide every child in America? Arizona specifically. Second question, how could we do that? What would be necessary in order to make that happen? And the third question is, what are the resources needed to do that? Because see, when you ask that resource question first, they give the answer, and then you have to design the answers to questions one and two based on the money. No. You define, and you cannot get away with saying what you want for every child, and know how to do it, and then say, but we're not given any money. You can't do that to the children of Arizona or of this great nation. So it is our challenge and our opportunity to define what it means, accountability for the whole system, and take within that our responsibility for our professional and professional practice. And the last area they better have in there is about equity. In this nation, the dropout rate doesn't vary year to year, not like the Dow Jones average. It's constant almost exactly the same for 25 years. It's about 75% graduation rate, 25% dropout. Unless you happen to be African American, Hispanic, or Native American, it's closer to 50%. In this society, if you bought light bulbs and 50% of them worked, people would be outraged. So how do we explain the tolerance, the acceptance of a system that every single year 
denies that for kids. 50% of that group. Why do we accept that? I mean, someone from another country coming here and knowing the history and the reality of America would have to say to us, why do you accept that? Why don't you do something about it? That's our responsibility. That's our challenge. So, as I look forward, I want you to know that I've been in this a long time. I started teaching 46 years ago. I didn't go into teaching to become a member of NEA. I didn't. I didn't even think about it. I wanted to teach. And one of the things that always inspired me is, uh, well, first of all, it just killed me. Uh, I don't know if this is true still in colleges, but when I was in college, I was just saying that those who can do, those who can't teach. God, I hated that. It just ate at my insides. And my senior year in college, one of my sisters, I've told you I have four, so I didn't grow up, I survived childhood. <laughs> one of my sisters gave me this cool mug. It said, those who can teach, all others find a less significant line of work. <laughs> now, in my own head now, I change that to those who can work in education. Because, see, every adult who works in that system, you have a set of skills that you could do other places. Why did you choose to do that in a school? To be a secretary is a lot easier in an office than in an elementary school. It's just... <laughs> serving food anywhere is easier than in a school, Kevin. <laughs> Driving a bus is easier anywhere. I mean, so the set of skills that people bring to their profession those skills are transferable to certain surroundings. Why did you choose education? So those who can work in education, all others find a less significant line of work. And what I would suggest to you is don't say that to everyone. Um, <laughs> kind of ticks them off. Um, but you need not say it out loud. There are inside words and outside words. But my golly, every single day of your life, you've got to feel that inside. And you probably do. My wife used to kid me that, I, you know, most of my teaching career, the first eight years, I had two jobs. And she said one day, it's always interesting to notice that you talk about going to work or going to school. Going to work was the second job. I never said going to work, meaning I was going to school. And I think that's a part of our mental feeling about what we do and why. So as we take this challenge on, we have to go back and tap into that about the why we came into this profession and why we chose to do that profession in public education. And the other thing you have to dig down and really answer for yourself, because no one else has the answer. Why do you keep coming back? Every year, no matter what they throw in your face, you keep coming back. The answer to those two questions are the most powerful things in the world. They are deep down inside you, and it's where you get your energy. It's where you get your passion. It gives you all of the commitment. And I want you to know that it matters so much. Our greatest danger or threat right now is not privatization, and it's not vouchers, and it's not charter schools. Our greatest threat is that those of us who are entrusted right now of being in this profession allow them to destroy what public education was for us. I grew up in a town of 1,600 people, 51 in my class. My dad was disabled, my mom was a teacher, and she was at that time a non-degree teacher, because remember, you didn't always need a college degree, so she, they would never pay her as much as a BA Step 1. So she made nothing. And I got to live my dream for 23 years in a high school classroom. The greatest threat is that kids like that will never, ever do that again. Do you know it is harder right now in 2014 than it was when I graduated from high school for a kid in those circumstances to make it, to follow a dream? I just happened to decide I wanted to be a math teacher. 
It wasn't magical that it was being a math teacher. It was for me. It wasn't for someone else. How, what happens if, with the college costs going the way they are, what happens when only a few can send their own son or daughter to college? Or if you're absolutely the cream of the crop, you'll get a scholarship. But what about people like me? I would have never gotten an uh, academic scholarship. I was a good student, but I wasn't a great student. You had to study to do that, my God. Um, <laughs> but to think that that would somehow be erased from our history, that's our greatest threat. And I'm gonna leave you with this thought. Whenever I get down, and you know, the challenges just seem, oh, overwhelming. There's one thing that I think about, and if it's not enough just to think about it, I go back and read. And it's about the Montgomery, Alabama bus boycott. First of all, Martin Luther King Jr. was asked to lead that. Do you know how old he was? 26. And it wasn't like this happened by accident. There was a lot of thought that went into who would refuse to give up their seat when Rosa Parks did that. So there was a lot of leadership in this that is inspiring just in and of itself. But that's not where I get my energy. For 381 days, no one got on a bus. For 381 days. In Montgomery, Alabama, the sun does not shine every day. It rains. And many of the people who were the bus riders didn't live close to where they worked. And there weren't nice wide sidewalks. They had to get up an hour and a half earlier or an hour earlier to get their kids ready because they need to build in time to walk to work. They had to be on their feet all day long and walk home. Entire families changed their life for 381 days because they believed in something. They believed in something that was so much bigger than themselves. It was about an ideal, about human rights, that they believed were far more important than any one of them as individuals. And I wonder to myself, what is it that I care deeply enough about that I will change my life every single day for the next 381? And I wonder whether collectively as a nation, whether this thing, this institution of public education is one of those. Do we believe in it enough that we would change our lives for 381 days? Through elections, through day-to-day -day work, to organize community people and say, by the way, the organize, organizing they did was incredible. They figured out how to do carpools, friendly people who would give rides, cab drivers who normally chose 45 cents only charged 10 cents, and then the city council made that illegal to do that because they were trying to kill this. They just couldn't believe that these people, just everyday common people, could have the discipline, the fortitude, and the focus. That's what we need. And I want you to know that today, I am more optimistic than I've been in 20 years, and way more optimistic than I was a year ago. Because we have been doing our homework. We have been building the kind of capacity and expertise and leadership and strength within this organization that we can take responsibility for our professions and for our professional practice. We can define with others a system of accountability that impacts and delivers for every child in America. It is not a lack of skills or knowledge that will keep us from achieving that. It's whether we have the will and this deep down energy that just drives you to do things. That's the question. I'm optimistic that we have that. I, um, 
Because when I talk to groups of people like this in this room, there's not one of us that the system didn't deliver for, or we wouldn't be here. And the day the, I, the, day the idea that it doesn't deliver for every child in America starts gnawing down deep, that's the day we'll do it. When you can't stand the thought that all of the cool things that we got to do in life, and it wasn't the thing we did, but we got to do what we wanted to do, what we believed in, what we dreamed about doing. When the idea that they would deny that of anyone is important enough to you that it just makes you have to get out of a chair and do something, that's the day we will succeed. Thank you, AEA. You are a tremendous group. I honor and respect what you do every day. NEA President Dennis Van Rokel and Arizona's own.